Let's go back to equality. There's uh, one new axiom that I need to introduce for equality, and that will be our last axiom ever for a while. Uh, so there are really not that many axioms. So, so here we go. Uh, this was the grammar, the syntax for equality, term, equal sign, term, and then you get a proposition, which is an assertion of equality. And semantically, what it means is uh, when you say A equals B, that means A is the same thing as B. That's the idea. And then how, how do you uh, do anything in proofs with it? Well, you've got axiom one, right? Saying this, that was axiom one things equal themselves, and then you had axiom two, which told you how you can use equality. So let me not write down all of axiom two, but basically axiom two said, let me write down the beginning of it. It said, if you know that x equals y, then blah, 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 right? It said, if you have an equality, then here's how you can use it. You can make a replacement and a proposition and get an equivalent proposition, something like that. Okay, so that's all we had for uh, deducing things related to equality. Um, we have a way to use equality. If you have an equality, then what you can deduce. And we have only this one measly little way to generate equalities. So right now, with our system as it stands, if we do not introduce any more axioms, Pretty much, there's no way to prove that anything equals anything else, except these silly little things equal themselves kind of things. So, yeah, we can prove that 3 equals 3. That's a consequence of axiom 1. But that's the only kind of equality we can get. Things equal themselves. Where are we going to get other equ equalities? Axiom 2 doesn't help. Axiom 2 says if you already have an equality, then you can do this and that. Where are we going to get other equalities? So this is what axiom 8 is meant to help with. So I'm calling this equality gained, just to give you a memorable title. So this is as opposed to axiom 2. Axiom 2 was called equality used. Okay, and here's the way it works. If a certain thing is true, if you can prove what I'm going to write down here, then you can conclude A equals B. So you see it gains you A equals B at the cost of you have to prove whatever I'm going to write down here. And here's what it is. If you can prove that for all Z, Z is in A, if and only if, z is in b, then you will have proven that a equals b. So uh, this is a way of proving a equals b. Let's read this without mentioning the bound variable. For all, so mentioning the bound variable, for all z, z is in, is in a if and only if z is in b. Without mentioning the bound variable, Everything has the property that it is in A if and only if it is in B. Uh, put another way, to be in A is equivalent to being in B. Being an element of A is equivalent to being an element of B. So that is a way of proving A equals B. Prove that being an element of A is equivalent to being an element of B. This is what axiom 8 gives us. So one interesting consequence of this axiom is that it allows you to prove that everything is a set. So it allows you to prove that if you take any uh, thing, let's call it y, then that thing is equal to the set of elements of itself. So uh, how would you read this? The set of z such that z is an element of y, or without mentioning the bound variable, it's the set of elements of y. So y equals the set of elements of y. And y is a free variable in this statement, but this can be proven as a standalone uh, proposition. This is just theorem 9. 
which you can see a nice proof in the notes. So I will not go through the proof, but I just want to point out that this is neat. It's saying everything is the set of elements of itself. So that means everything is a set in one way or another. Everything can be written as the set of blah. At least you can write everything as a set of elements of itself. So that's why it's called set theory. That's why what we're doing is called set theory. And, you know, when you see things like this, you start to think, oh, this theory is actually really uh, uh, applicable only in special situations where sets are getting involved or the idea of, of membership and inclusion is getting involved directly. But that is not true. Uh, this framework that we're building up, set theory, can be applied to pretty much all of mathematics. There are very few exceptions, uh, but pretty much anything you're going to do in uh, upper division math classes, if you take those, uh, almost anything you would do in grad school, uh, almost everything, set theory is sufficient for handling. So what we're building up is actually a language that can be used to uh, talk about math in all of the familiar settings and the new unfamiliar ones that, that you will encounter later, all in one unified language. So you've seen, you know, calculus, differential equations, linear algebra, um, all of those can be put into a set theory framework. And it's the very same set theory that you're learning in this course. So compare, uh, okay, so unrelated point now, compare what you're seeing here in this uh, thing that you would have to prove to prove that A equals B. Compare this to what you see in the definition of inclusion. Um, in the definition of A is a subset of B, you would see this, but with the arrow just going one way, just like this. Or B is a subset of A would have the arrow going the other way, like that. So then equality just has the arrow going both ways. And we can describe it like this. So this is theorem 10. A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So remember these inclusions you should this is a def this is defined in definition 6 so you should when you see this sort of expand it in your mind into the full thing that it says it says every element of A is an element of B. This one says every element of B is an element of A. So a equals B if and only if, what did we say earlier? We said uh, if being an element of A is equivalent to being an element of B, then A equals B. I hope this sounds right to you, that if being an element of A implies being a, you're an element of B, and being an element of B implies you're an element of A, then being an element of A is equivalent to being an element of B. So this is, uh, you know, we, we often use this actually much more than we would use axiom eight. We would use theorem 10 much more often than we use axiom eight. And the reason for that is that using axiom eight requires you to prove a double arrow statement here. Whereas using theorem 10 sort of naturally splits things up and says, prove this which contains a single arrow going one way and then prove this, which contains a single arrow going the other way. Double arrow statements, and if and only if, those are usually pretty hard to prove, actually. Uh, what, what is often easier in, in e any remotely complicated situation, what is often easier is to prove the individual arrows separately. You know, the path from hypothesis, uh, the path from here to there, uh, the deductive path from one proposition to another is often easier than, than trying to create carve a deductive path where every step you take is an if and only if. So pe people use this 
more frequently. Um, and what that means is when you go to prove an equality, when you are asked to prove an equality, or when you are reading a proof of an equality, the proof will often be split into two parts, the inclusion one way and the inclusion the other way. So this should remind you of uh, what happens when you're trying to prove uh, an if and only if, a double arrow like this. The proof splits into two parts, right? One arrow and the other arrow. So same thing, when you're proving an equality, the proof splits into two parts, one for each inclusion.